the webinar has started. Oh, that's how you know it's serious. Hi, Chloe. Hi. <laughs> People are coming on, right? It probably takes a minute because mm -hmm. it's also lunchtime right now. It is. I'm assuming people I, might be grabbing food and it's fine for people to eat, right? We can, we'll, yeah. we'll let people eat. We're fine with that. It is mm -hmm. like back in the middle of lunch. Exactly. And all my students are troopers. Like, <laughs> uh, we, we actually, we just finished class at 1210. So they had 20 okay. minutes. So, so there's like no, hello. There's, there's no, no time. time for them to eat. Like they got out of class and they're just like running to the next thing. I know. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> I hope you guys. I just want you to have so much. <laughs> you can eat while we're talking. We don't care. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about this beeping. You know, like whenever I get like an iMessage, it just goes up on my screen. I don't know how to turn that off. But if it beeps, I'm sorry. I'm just bad with this. So. It is. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Hi everyone. Okay. I know everyone's tired. Mm -hmm. I'm tired too. Okay, there are more people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi Kendra. So, so Dorothy, this is going to be kind of what the format is. When you're talking, I'll highlight you. Um, okay. So and it's like then, interview or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It'll be okay. speech review, and then we'll have the class discussion after after that. That's and right. then okay. we'll open yeah. we'll open to comments to everyone in the last twenty minutes of the the okay. conversation. If so there it's going to run until one thirty, right? It'll go to one yes. thirty. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So. I hope everyone's doing well and like just feel free to eat food if you need to eat while we're doing this because it is like as mm -hmm. we were lunch time so everyone should just eat <laughs> like you know it's like the middle of the day mm -hmm. so we can wait a little bit yeah yeah i think i think i'll wait for kate to maybe like give me the signal um if there's okay. a certain time that yeah. she wanted to wait until um but otherwise I'll get started whenever yeah. I feel like it. And again, if I freeze oh, up, go ahead. please let me know if I freeze up so I can like, I mm -hmm. might have to exit. Cause I'm having, I'm just telling the students too, I'm having Wi-Fi problems you all. So if I freeze, oh, no. I might have to exit and come back. So let's see. So are these all your students? I think everyone's here. Are we missing? Wait, uh, we might be missing someone. No, I think everyone's here, right? There's nine of you. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Dorothy Wong edition. Um, okay. Now it's, you know, it's the webinar thing. I guess I have to highlight myself. I didn't do this last time. Yep. Uh, spotlight for everyone. Hello. This is my office. Okay. Um, hello. Welcome to the second event of this spring's queer and trans Asian American poetry series. I'm Yin Yi, lecturer in creative writing and instructor for contemporary queer and trans Asian American poetry, the class which sparked a thousand events, also known as just this reading series. Oh, Kate, you will talk, take over spotlighting? Thank you. Um, this is the second of five events during which we'll have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming poets, scholars, and filmmakers to the Dartmouth community. If you'd like to follow along and to peek at the reading list, you can find more info here. Uh, I've made part of the, I've made the reading list for this class um, open to anyone. Um, and special thanks to Kathleen Gibble of the English and Creative Writing Department, without whom the logistical, technical, and marketing aspects of this series would not be possible. And of course, thank you to the de department itself for agreeing to host the series for my class and the wider community here at Dartmouth. So, that's my preamble spiel. Um, as a poet, I'm very uh, experienced in reading things out loud. So today, my class and I have the pleasure of welcoming poet and critic Dorothy Wong. Dorothy Wong is professor and chair of the American Studies program at Williams College. Her monograph, Thinking Its Presence, Form, Race, and Subjectivity in Contemporary Asian American Poetry, was published in 2014 by Stanford University Press. It won the 2016 Association for Asian American Studies Award for Best Book in Literary Criticism and was also awarded honorable mention by the Pegasus Awards for Poetry Criticism given by the Poetry Foundation. Uh, the first National Conference on Race and Creative Writing was named after the book and was held in 2014, 2015, and 2017. She conceived of and co-founded the Race and Poetry and Poetics in the UK, Rathapuk, Collective, 
which held its second conference at Queens College, Cambridge University in October 2018. So that's the official bio, and then I have some extra notes from me. It seems important to note that Wong's book has inspired a continued conversation around innovative poetics, poetics and race, both in this conference and elsewhere. I personally encountered Wong's work first when encountering Thinking Its Presence, the conference. That is, a bunch of my poetry friends would go to this conference and I would later enviously listen to their recollections of the workshops and discussions being had there. Then it seemed as though Wong's work was everywhere in the discourse in the conversation around race and poetry, which I, a young poet emerging in my own consciousness, couldn't help but be around. I met her for the first time in 2019 when she was an organizer, I think, and a speaker at CUNY's two-day Poetry Studies Now Symposium. And just last year, Michael Leung uh, organized an online symposium in dialogue with her book. So um, I invited Wong today to discuss her work on Pamela Rue's 1998 book. I said, I've been saying 1999 because that's what it says in my book, but maybe it's 1998. Pamela, a novel, and her ongoing work on Asian American poetry. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you so much, Yenny, and also Kate and Dartmouth and all the students for coming out. I know it's a lot to like, this is a really hard time in the semester. I'm chairing American studies at Williams and I'm also teaching and I know everyone's exhausted from this, the pandemic year and Zoom. So thank you so much for even showing up. Um, I thought I'd begin by just telling you maybe a little bit of background about the book, why I wrote the book, and then say a few words about the chapter specifically on Pamela Lou. And then I'll read a little bit from it. I don't wanna to read too much. And then I just really wanna open it up to questions. And we could talk about anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be just focused on Pamela novel. We can talk about um, Asian American poetry, you know, all sorts of things. So I just wanna keep it really open. So if people are feeling like, well, I didn't really read the chapter that much, or I didn't really read Pamela novel carefully, that's fine. We can have a conversation. So, um, I guess I should just start from the beginning, which is that this book started as my dissertation way back in the 1990s. And um, at that time, there really wasn't very much written on Asian American poetry. There really wasn't that much at that time even written about Asian American literature in the scholarly world or even anywhere. So um, it started as my dissertation. It took a really long time. It, it um, sort of sat there for a long time, actually. After I graduated, my first job was at Wesleyan. I taught there for a year. I did a postdoc at San Diego for a year. Then I went to Northwestern and taught in the English department there. So, it, and then I moved to Williams in, in 2006. So, um, so for a long time, I did not revisit the dissertation until it was like, okay, if I want to keep my job and I want to get tenure, I have to write this book. So I did go back to it and um, added chapters to it. And the impetus for the book really was on it actually the impetus um, the, the sort of reasons I wrote the book there were sort of multi-level reasons for it I think at the very um, at the very basic level I felt like I wanted to showcase Asian American poetry there was a lot of good Asian American poetry um, and it had not really been discussed at all in literary criticism it was not really seen as part of American literature American poetry or English language poetry so at the just at the very minimal level I wanted to 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 showcase a body of work that had been ignored. Then if you sort of go a, sort of more meta, uh, at the next level, I was really disturbed by the fact that when critics talked about minority poetry, not just Asian American poetry, but minority poetry, and even minority literature in general, they tended to look at the content only to be driven by the thematics, kind of doing a sociological reading, like, oh, I would like to learn about like, what Chinese American or Chinese people feel. So I'm gonna read The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. Or, and they would treat actually like a poem by Li Young Lee the same way. Like I'm going to learn about this culture by reading this poem. And there was like no attention, virtually no attention paid to form, to anything about poetics. And so that to me seemed like really kind of crazy because it, somebody could have written, you know, a memoir, they could have written a newspaper article. Why did they have to write this as a poem? And it's really important to pay attention to the form. So that was the other level. And then there's another level about just the field of literary studies, which was that it, I mean, it was very, very white and it still is. And there was a lot of sort of racial assumptions about poetry that passed itself off. These assumptions were sort of passed off as like neutral, objective, um, ideas about poetics, 
So there was this critique at this larger level, which is mainly taken up in my introductory chapter about the kind of, um, I mean, to put it bluntly, the racism within literary studies and the racism in poetry studies and the kind of um, racialized assumptions that were kind of covered over and people never talked about it. Even in the avant-garde world, which kind of pride, prided itself on being more hip and open and in and, and like politically left than like the traditional poetry world. So those are sort of the multiple levels of why I wrote the book. Um, and then the particular chapter on Pamela novel, which I think most of you have looked at, had to do with thinking about, I mean, it's about diaspora and it's about um, thinking through diaspora in, in a way that was slightly different from how people had thought about it before. So I, I, I'm just trying to, cause it's been a while, but um, a couple of things I had been thinking about at the time was that, you know, when you think of diaspora, like Chinese diaspora, it often does have the danger of essentializing a kind of quote unquote blood connection, you know, and so, of course, I think a lot of people have critiqued this and, and I was concerned about that. I was also concerned about the very easy ways people sort of talked about border crossing. So there was a kind of trendiness around diaspora for a while around like hybridity, border crossing, cosmopolitanism, being diasporic. And I had a critique of that as well because I felt like a lot of people sort of went to thinking transnationally because they did not wanna think about the difficult questions around race and racism that it is often nationally rooted. So that was another way, that was another sort of point that I wanted to contest. And I think the other thing, as I recall, was that I was always, as with the entire book, I was always concerned that Asian American literature and Asian American poetry was always um, conflated with Asian language literature because Asian Americans are always seen as foreign. And, and so there, there was this reading of Asian American literature as somehow, as I said, not part of the English literary tradition, is not part of English language literature. So as you know, with that chapter, I talk a lot about how like diasporic um, connections often can be through the English language and through a shared experience in Anglophone, say Anglophone countries of like Chinese Australians, Chinese Canadians, Chinese in Britain, um, of, of a shared sort of racial experience, um, often experience of racism, but also this kind of connection to English, even though it's very problematic, it's like the colonizer's language, but it's also a way, as I think Pamela Liu explores in her book of, of finding a, a home, home in quotation marks, but you know, the home of the sentence, you know, so writing becomes a way that connects people. So I was very interested in like placing emphasis also on the English language aspect of this diasporic writing and not just on this kind of like identity of like shared like ethnic racial identity, which of course is important, but it's it can tend to obscure other things as well. So that's sort of the rationale behind the chapter. Um, so I guess one thing I could do, I know, I don't know how many of you had the, you all have the chapter, but I just thought I'd read a little bit from pages 286 and 287. And then we could open it up for questions. I know that the, 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 the chapter talks a lot about the subjunctive mood. And this is a section right before the discussion of the subjunctive that's more about the question of the I. Um, so let me read that. And I just want to tell you, all, I have really bad eyesight. I'm actually was going to have eye surgery. So this book, I have to take my glasses off and the book is going to be very close to my face, but I'm going to read it and then we can have the discussion. So this is on 286, like the second paragraph. So I say, yet while P, of course, the, the character in the book, uh, in the book, yeah. Yet while P resists her interpolation into the category of identity implied by quote unquote ancestral memory, she does not find solace in that very American refuge, the privileged idea of the self or the individual or its corollary reserved for ethnic Americans, that is identity. Indeed, P and her friends find the notion of the self vexing, if not illusory. And this is a quote from Pamela Novel, a block quote. The self was a mystery so consumed by its own questioning that it had no room left for us, a condition which we nevertheless preferred since we were totally unprepared for the alternative. We desperately depended on, upon the spectacle of the large eye with all its artifice and white noise to keep us alive and functional in the world. We sometimes wondered who this I, and she puts I in quotes, really was. Raw speculation placed I at the dawn of Western civilization. There was no way to find I without by definition losing it and therefore losing ourselves. And then I write, 
The narrator makes clear that the cohesive Cart Cartesian eye is a fiction, a powerful one that had a historical moment of origin, half jokingly adduced to a vague, but nevertheless not imaginary or a historical point, quote unquote, the dawn of Western civilization. It is a large spectacle, one that is not unraced, parentheses, characterized by white noise. Again, each member of the we has the shared experience looking for the I. In the process, they risk losing themselves and their minds. In other words, the usual American recourse of looking inward to find oneself and the ethnic American writer's imposed obligation to write autobiographically, not only does not lead to answers, but results in more disjunctions. And again, another quote, block quote from the novel. Years of self-exploration had revealed a complex collection of personality traits, tendencies, habits, and passions, but I can never quite associate these characteristics with myself, much less imagine what such an individual might possibly be like. And another quote from her, since society could no longer correctly identify us, we had to identify ourselves, even if we could not identify with ourselves, even if our identifications were inadequate and the self itself was wrong. Um, so I go on a little bit, maybe, maybe I'll read one more paragraph from what I said. I said, um, I could never quite associate these characteristics with myself that quote from her echoes the earlier claim that quote, the history of our lives was always the history of something else. And P's description of C's, another character, C's quote unquote, coming home single to watch the double of his face peel away from itself, both brings to mind W.E.B. Du Bois's famous concept of double consciousness. Both bring to mind, both of those quotes bring to mind W.E.B. Du Bois's famous concept of double consciousness. Lou has spoken of how the pronoun I functions as both pronoun and initial as if I were another separate character in the text. So then I talk more about that. So I think I'll end there, but maybe open it up just to questions or comments or anything uh, about either Pamela novel or what I wrote or anything, whatever people feel like talking about. Thank you, Dorothy, so much. The, the tiny Zoom claps. <laughs> um, so I think we can bring in um, the rest of the class. So I guess we'll unspotlight both of us. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that we can even just start from like what you just read and this kind of, um, I can ask a question and I think the class, um, if you wanna take a moment as well while we're speaking to think of your your own questions, um, we'll, we'll have a discussion with the class for 20 minutes and then Anyone who's here, um, I see Chinging actually from last week is here, which is really great. Hi, Chinging. Um, and uh, you can all ask questions as well, um, which we will direct to the Q&A. So um, Dorothy, I'm so glad that you um, read this section because I feel like uh, there's so much going on here in, in Pamela's book um, about just this idea of, of these various kinds of selves and what kind of self this uh, narrator in the book has access to even, um, which you kind of talk about um, with the idea of the Cartesian eye. Um, I was wondering like what you thought about just like, I don't really have a question, I guess, but I, I really loved the way that you kind of broke this down. Um, I'm having a brain fog. <laughs> That's okay. I think we're all in fog mode right now. So Yeah, I know. Um, there's so much to say about the thing that's really, um, I think, profound about this book is that there's so much to say about it. And it's all kind of spoken about through these tonal ways of speaking. Um, and I was wondering, like, how you thought when you were reading through the book, and obviously there's quotes that we can look at in Pamela to speak about this, but like um, how, where you found kind of the self um, in, in this book and how, and what you thought about kind of how elusive it was um, and what you thought the relationship really between I and me and P and Pamela was. Um, it's talked about in the book a little bit, but I still feel like I personally am, trying to understand like who are they in relation to each other um, or these versions of the self, how they're in relation to each other. Right, that's a, that's a really good question. Actually, I'll say a little bit of background too because um, for a period when I was, 
before I wrote this uh, chapter, I was in contact with Pamela, um, Lou, Pamela Lou, and we talked a little bit about that, but I've actually lost touch and it's been a very long time. Um, but I remember, so, so Pamela Lou was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. I was a grad student there, but I don't, I don't remember if we met at the time when we were, I think I got to know her more after we had left Berkeley. So she was a math, they, I, I guess she goes by they now. At the time it was she, so I'm sorry about the pronoun. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't know, actually, we can talk about that also, the, the gender and the sexuality part, because there mm -hmm. was a little bit of um, revision later. But at the time she went by she, but now I think it could be they, I'm not sure. Um, they were a math major at Berkeley and actually work in the tech industry as far as I know still at the time. Right, so, um, so I asked uh, Pamela at the time, how did you get into doing experimental writing? Because of course we know like things like the Joy Luck Club, there are many modes of writing and I have no problem with those modes of writing that tend to be more autobiographical, more straightforward, Lee Young Lee, you know, there are a lot of poets and fiction writers that, and, and I said, how did you end up even doing this more experimental writing? And what they told me at the time was that they never felt that those more straightforward autobiographical works like you know, woman warrior or any of those reflected their experience. And so it wasn't mm. like they chose intentionally to write an experimental work. It was that the complexity of their experience was not, could not be captured any other way. So mm -hmm. I do think that, and the other thing I should note for the students with this particular work is that it is a play on the very famous seminal novel in English in, in British literature, you know, Samuel Richardson's Pamela, which is considered one of the founding texts of novel, novelist, of the novelistic tradition. And that's an epistolary novel. So there, Pamela Lou is also playing off of, a, consciously playing off of a very important book in English literature, okay? So it's a Romana Clay here because these initials actually do refer to people that the author knew in the Bay Area, but of course gets transmuted in the text. And then there was a kind of interesting conversation I had with Pamela Liu when I was about to publish the chapter, which I could talk about later about, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but so I think the idea of the self as marketed by the publishing industry and what we mostly think of as like autobiographical ethnic novel we all have to question that a bit because that's a kind of packaged diversity thing. I mean, I'm not saying all, I love like women. I love lots of things that are autobiographical, but what gets touted or what gets marketed, one has to think about because Pamela novel, this particular text, I think was absolutely one of the most brilliant texts of its time. And also even within now within American literature, but it never found a wider audience for obvious reasons, probably. We can talk about that. Yet other books like The Joylet Club or other things will, will have this mass audience, right? And, and we have to think, and not all of that is about the quality. It's not about the quality of the work. So I think the idea of the I in the history of the, of, of the Western enlightenment tradition, but also within poetry and liter literature, and certainly in the English speaking world, has been predicated on an unspoken male, white, not poor, you know, like a heterosexual uh, subject, but nobody talks about it. So for example, I'll use, I'll talk about like Robert Frost. Many of us grew up reading Robert Frost. You know, Robert Frost is a good poet. I like Robert Frost, but Robert Frost's poems like St Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening or The Road Not Taken, is read as a like a universal lesson for everyone about like the nature of human life or whatever, you know. But really it was written by a white middle-aged New England straight man with a family living near Bennington, you know, who went to Harvard and right. So it isn't a universal unmarked neutral eye, but it's passed off. And so no one ever thinks that like a poem by say Marilyn Chin is a universal poem about a poem about the universal human condition, right? So this is one of the things that I want students to think about that a lot of the things you learn in say poetry writing workshops or in your English classes often gets passed off as like, this is just neutral. 
This is just objective. Like, but it's not. So you have to think about that. And so for me, when you think about, and I remember talking to John Yao, who's another one of the poets I dealt with, um, I wrote about in my in my book. And, and he was very, you know, he said that like, he grew up in like outside of Boston and there'd been a lot of like confessional poets like Robert Lowell and, you know, um, even like Jack, Jack Kerouac and, um, and who had come from that area, Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath. And he said, I never thought I could write a confessional poem because who would be interested in this like Chinese American man? <laughs> like, you know, it just never felt like it was universalizable. And that's, and he's right, you know? So that's where I think we have to think a lot about that I. And, and the other thing I would say just to add to this is that I think with um, minority writers, ethnic minority writers, um, people just presume often that everything they write is autobiographical. So there's also this weird like pressure. On, like, like, so I know that sometimes when I'm teaching like Asian American, like say a poem by Marilyn Chin, it's natural that the students often imagine or assume that the I in the poem is like, Mar so they'll say Marilyn did this or Marilyn. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a difference between the poet and the poetic speaker, right? Like you can't presume that this poem is, is, is pure autobiography. And the interesting thing is, I remember having this discussion with um, Henry Abeloff, who had been one of my mentors and was one of the founders of Gay and Lesbian Studies. He said he had the opposite problem. So when he was teaching Frank O'Hara, who's a gay, white, very good poet who, who's not, no longer alive. Um, he was like, I had a problem because all the students presumed that his, that O'Hara's poems were just universal poems. And then Henry was trying to get them to see that there was like a lot of like 1950s gay male speech, urban speech in those poems. So mm. then you have to wonder like, why is that happening? Like certain poets, are getting read very auto only autobiographically and others are getting read universally even if there are all these autobiographical or biographical facts that are actually pertinent or historical context that's important. So I'll just stop there, but um, I think the eye is a great answer. Yeah, the eye is, the lyric is very premised on the eye usually, right? So the lyric, mm -hmm. lyric poetry, what you usually read as a poem is very premised on a notion of that autobiographical eye. So we really have to think about that. So I don't know if you well, just have a question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really speaks to actually the brilliance of the book because of, I think, the, I think uh, Pamela Novel is very cognizant of the possible readings and it, it has very specific style, it uses very specific stylistic techniques to basically um, brush those off in different ways or elude them or escape them as, as we were talking in class earlier. Um, right. But I wanted and to open up to the class. Yes. Let me just say one quick thing before the students, which I just to add to what you said, which is that what's so brilliant and what is actually very good in a lot of a lot of poetry by minority poets is that they're using the form itself, like the subjunctive or the use of the pronoun or the letter to actually question things. And it's not just in the thematic content of what's being said. So I think that was another thing that I wanted to do in my book, which was to get people to think about the form and the the actual writing, not just the the like the summarizable message, you know, because there is no one message, right? But let me open it to the students. I'm talking too much. Yeah. Yeah. So does anyone have a question that you would like to ask? I'm so good at silence, but you know. <laughs> Wait, I'll silence I have too. a question. I'm wondering if it, yeah. Okay. This be, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I am thinking about poetry as um, kind of the way it's taught as a um, usually a white art form and with a lot of restrictions and a lot of structure and a lot of rules to follow that seem to overall make it inaccessible, maybe in particular to people of color. Um, and I'm also thinking about how Pamela, a novel, um, uses really hard English, like very academic. And um, really, you talk about this in your chapter, um, creates this almost perfect English. And how that um, brings up 
the question of how maybe all English speakers relate to English. And I think you say this as well, but how um, maybe every English speaker has a subjunctive relationship to English. But to me, it feels like maybe there's some kind of conflict there with how a novel that is hard is maybe using the master's tools to make this commentary about um, everyone, everyone's relationship to English, but at the same time, if it's hard, is it inaccessible? And is it the project of um, some kind of, yeah, is it a project to make poetry more accessible? So how can there be both at once? That's a really good question. It's actually one that I encounter quite a bit, when, especially when I'm teaching experimental minority poetry, um, which I teach quite, and in fact, I have to write, I have to title the class Experimental Minority Writing because so many people are scared of poetry that they wouldn't take it, the class probably. And I think, so I wanna, so there's several parts to your question and I wanna address them. One is that I think you're right. I think poetry does have this very intimidating um, reputation. I think a lot of people have been just scarred by their high school experience or just like Shakespeare, you know, whatever that you have to know all this technical knowledge and iambic pentameter and all these technical terms in order to, to have any access and, and poetry, was traditionally and still I think really does continue to be like considered the most elite literary form within certainly in the, within the English tradition. And I think that that is, prob is deeply problemat problematic. It's also a function, frankly, of British colonialism. I mean, the reason why we have English departments is because the British empire had vast sway and we were a colony here, you know? So, um, and the fact is that part of that power of the British of the British Empire was to really argue that they were superior, not only racially, but because they had superior cultural products. And of course, Shakespeare is like the number one thing that gets pulled out, you know, like, this is like a brilliant, the greatest poet that ever lived, blah, 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 you know. So I do think that um, when I teach those classes, often there is an initial reaction from students where they're like, I don't understand this, or if it's difficult, to, or they're like, I can't relate to this, or my grandmother can't read this, right? And I get that, you know, I do get that. But I actually find paradoxically that when you have an experimental text um, I mean, this this is a little unusual because it's more like a prose piece. It's less of a poetry. It, it feels more like a, a novel, as it's called, self-consciously called. Um, that sometimes when you have a very experimental poetry book, surprisingly, it actually is dem democratizing. Because I don't care if you've had Shakespeare. I don't care if you know what a trochee is, you know, or a dactyl. You're not going to be able to, you're going to be, it sort of levels the playing field for everyone because everyone's there trying to figure out what's going on together. So I've actually found paradoxically that when you teach experimental work, even though it's difficult, difficult, it seems difficult, it's often not like straightforwardly transparent, that it actually eat, let, allows everyone to try to like decipher what's going on or try to figure out what's going on. So there is a way in which it doesn't give any, there's no privilege for necessarily the English major you know, so that's one side of it. I also would ask everyone to question what is considered accessible or what is considered transparent, because often that itself is also encrusted with um, a lot of ideological baggage. So let me use one example. So one of the poets I teach frequently is an African-American poet named Will Alexander. He lives in LA. Will Alexander does not teach in the academy. He went to UCLA for his BA, but beyond that, never went to it like an elite school, doesn't teach at a school, um, kind of has had jobs, just like regular jobs. Uh, I think for a while worked at, at a construction company, sort of answering the phone. Um, and his work is full of scientific language, full of like difficult words. Um, Cause he's just super interested in like geology and like, you know, science and all kinds of things. So sometimes the students will say to me, why is this so hard? It's like, why is he using these words on purpose to seem really erudite? Like this does not speak to the people. And I'm like, why are you assuming that a black working class person from South Central LA only speaks one way, which I assume is like black English or, you know, like this is, 
this is every, it's every much his right or his like, it is in fact what he did, which was to be interested um, in very difficult stuff and to put it in his, in his poetry. And I, and that's no less of the community than, I think one of my students once used like Sapphire's push, you know, as an example, that, that became precious, the, the movie as like, that was more with the people. And I'm like, okay, but let's question that too. So I think that it's often much more complicated, but I hear what you're saying, but I do think that we have to also, also open up our idea of what is relatable or accessible because often what seems relatable or accessible is often commodified and is packaged by a publishing industry. So we have to think about that as well. And, it's, and we have to think about which books really hit the bestseller list and which other ones don't. And I think there's a rich complexity and variety to minority writing stylistically, content wise. Um, so, and often that is not seen in what makes like the New York Times bestseller list or what gets sold, you know, or gets written about. So that's something to think about, but thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanna like th say like, that's a really great question. Great. Um, answer. And I think, Dorothy, you're really kind of getting into kind of the politics of difficulty and and what um, the kind of permission that Pamela and Lou really needed to feel in order to write the book, I feel that uh, they ended up writing here. Because um, there's, as I think one of the things that I hear a lot from, from um, students here, but also elsewhere, um, is that you really can end up feeling boxed into a certain kind of writing and feeling like you have to uh, fulfill all of the requirements of your writing being accessible so that it, it can follow your politics in the right ways. But um, something that ends up happening is that you actually end up uh, constraining yourself from being able to write in the ways that feel most comfortable for you. Something that struck me uh, that Dorothy, you were saying earlier about um, Pamela Lou needing to kind of write experimentally in order to write something that felt aligned with their experience, I think actually kind of makes you wonder about the category of experimental. Like why is writing into the style or um, way of poetry that, um, or, or prose that would allow for that kind of expression of experience? Why is that considered experimental in the first place? Right, that's absolutely right. I mean, I remember because the other one of the other poets I write on is Marilyn Chin, and her work is considered more like lyric and traditional, but she brings a lot of Chinese. Like she tried to do this experimentation with Chinese form, and she often said to me, like, "Why is my stuff not considered experimental?" Right. So I think there is a kind of high modernist legacy of what we consider experimental, which is fracturing of syntax, or, you know, so that yeah, absolutely. I think the category of experimental itself has to be questioned, like why some things are or aren't. But but actually, I just thought of something in response to the previous question, which is there is a particular burden on Asian American writers, I think, in relation to this idea of difficulty or English. Um, yes, it's true that all of us everyone has a kind of, you know, any kind of language is not natural to anyone, like we're all, but I do think that Asian Americans, because of the way Asian American subjects have been received as just constitutively foreign and non-native speakers. So I've said this to, in other contexts where like, I have a totally American accent, okay? I grew up in North Carolina. My parents are actually English professors. So I'm a second generation English professor. I've had people ask me like, is English your native language? You know, I've had students ask me that. I've had, it's not very common, but I had did have a student ask me that. I've had like philosophy professors with PhDs ask me that. I, had, I remember this one man said, is English your native language? And before I could even answer, he said, I think not. So this presumption, especially about Asian Americans, that they're not, that they're foreign. And we all, and many of us have had that experience where people ask you where you're from and you tell them and they say, no, where are you really from? And I think even post, the, you know, with the Atlanta murders and a lot of us were having to give, you know, we were giving talks and things about this. There was this confusion about, do we say anti-Asian violence or anti-Asian American violence, you know? And this whole confusion of Asian American and Asian is so common. Mm -hmm. um, because of the history of this, this like the, the, the view of Asian Americans as just absolutely not American and foreign. I don't care how long, how many generations. And so I do think there is a, 
I'm not, I, I think black Americans have also their vexed relationship that they've been like seen as never like standard speakers of English. But because we're talking particularly here about Pamela, I think that perfect translators English that, sh that they write about, that, that Pamela Lou writes about is about having to like out, like to be even better in English than a native speaker because you're trying to prove, it's like an offensive gesture and it's a defensive gesture. It's like, I can do English better than you can, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is a very racialized position. I don't think, I'm not thinking that, you know, that, uh, let me think. Well, every writer has its vex. every writer has their vex relation to the language and writing, but I'm just thinking it's not the same for someone like, I don't know, John Cheever or something, you know? Speaking of an old dead white writer, but um, so yeah. But I'm also, you know, it's just difficult, and 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 I am happy to talk with students about, um, like I think you and I talked about this, Yanni, earlier about my career as an Asian American literary scholar. I don't write poetry anymore. I wrote a long time ago, but um, but also the you know there's the the reality that whatever you write is going to be reviewed, is going to be read, is going to be received by readers that often don't understand the complexities of Asian American experience and will project on. And that's just a reality that people have to contend with. So that I've seen in the past, I don't know, it still happens, I think, where an Asian American writer will be writing in English and they're actually talking about very like Western things. And the reviewer will like bring up like Buddhism or the reviewer will bring up like Confucius something, you know, because it's being projected onto that um, particular writer that they're coming out of an Asian tradition. And I know when I was writing my book and people would ask me like, what are you writing on? And I would say Asian American poetry and they automatically think it was like Japanese haiku or, and one person even said to me, that doesn't make sense. Like, cause I was teaching an American studies program and I was working on Asian American and the person was like, wait, how, that doesn't make sense. Like, why are you doing Asian, Asian stuff in an American studies program? So that's still pretty common, I would think. I don't think that's disappeared, but let me hear from more students. So I also wanted to open the floor to anyone in the audience who wants to add a question to the Q&A as well, because we're in the Yeah, the I'm minutes. actually not looking at the Q&A, so you guys can help me with that, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or if anybody, ching in, anybody wants to ask anything, or students, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. Well, actually, let me ask one question to the students, since everyone's so quiet. Did you not like the book, like Pamela, a novel? Did people like not, because it's something written at the turn of the millennium. And it was really, really, um, I still think it's a very good book, but I'm wondering, did students find it dated? Did you not like it because it was accessible? Or did, I'm just curious what the reaction was to the book itself. For research purposes. No, no, just because I'm curious. I'm always curious how books age over, uh, how, that the reception is because um what did you all did you like it not like it did it drive you crazy was it annoying was it like exciting i really like the book um okay. i've been criticized okay. before. hi <laughs> hi uh, <laughs> yeah i've been criticized before for having very technical writing actually so reading this book i was like you know she go go <laughs> um, like, okay yeah uh, in a sense i found it to be really timeless um <laughs> just because there were, um, and we were talking about this in class, like there are so many quotable moments just literally on each page of um, Pamela's novel. And um, I was going to ask, um, like, is there is there something to gain from reading our own writing into the Western narrative? Because I, I think um, like one of those things that we can gain is like connecting with other minority writers. There's, we, we use the Western narrative to find um, similarities, but then we also like lose our individuality. And um, I think in Pamela's novel, she was, this is where she brings out the pronoun we, um, but is there maybe an experimental space where we can still find each other? That's a great question. I mean, I think her, their novel is actually a way to think about finding another space of community and just survivability, frankly, as like minority experimental writers. 
I mean, that's, I think, the other possible home that language offers. I mean, I want to be clear because I actually had a student ask me this the other day at Williams, like, well, and this was a white student who actually asked me, like, why should we even read the, like, tradition? Because these people are so racist and a lot of these earlier poets, like, they're horrible. Yeah, you know, they are. A lot of them are horrible, you know, like with their politics, frankly, like Pound and Eliot. And I mean, you know, um, but I think it is, I, I don't think it's either or, like you throw out the whole tradition and all the traditional stuff, and then you only look at experimental stuff or you only look at like contemporary experimental writing. I think that the fact is that there is such thing as a literary tradition, but we want to contest it. Like you want to, so you have to sort of, you know, like in the way that Pamela Lou is writing in response to Samuel Richardson, but just doing something very different and frankly undermining, or at least, well, maybe not undermining, but certainly adding their own brilliant take to the notion of what a novel is. I think that nobody writes in a vacuum. Like nobody is writing out of like just their head, like they haven't read other books in English and, or they're not thinking about, they're not being influenced by their historical moment or the ideas in a, in a particular moment of history. That, that's just impossible. So I do think that one engage, one has to, one has to engage with like, if you're a poet, you've got to read Shakespeare. You've got to read Milton. You have to know what came before, but it doesn't mean that minority writers always have to be on the margins and the periphery. I think one of the things that I'm also contesting these days is the ways in which when we talk about like poetics or like poetry, it's always like canonical white writers that are the examples. And then like, and then the minority writers are often thrown in as like, here's a black writer, here's an Asian American writer. I would say that, you know, like to go back to say someone like Will Alexander. Will Alexander has a lot to say about poetics. And I would center Will Alexander. I would center Pamela Lou. I don't think that they're just these add on tokenized, you know, diversity like detail, you know, like diversity accessories, right? So I do think that. Yes, I mean, how can, I mean, we're not gonna invent like English from whole cloth, <laughs> like, 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 like one thing about using language is it's a system that's already in place and that's had a long history and you've got to deal with it. Like you can't just make up your own language. So I do think that, and same with narratives, same with like poetic forms, they're there, but I definitely think that we have to decenter whiteness when we think about poetry and poetics. And I do feel like, writing maybe because I'm you know I'm like an English person I love poetry and so part of me really does feel like there's a possibility of something of I don't care how hostile the world is if you can write and then there's a way in which you can have some sort of like agency um, in your own writing and I say that to students actually because sometimes you know we I'm at Williams which is like Dartmouth a very elite predominantly white school and sometimes we have minority students who are just like, it's so traumatic to be here. It's so difficult. Sometimes they take medical leave. Sometimes they have to, and I often say, look, can you write about it? Is there a way to transmute that negative experience? And I will say that with my book, a lot of what drove my book was anger. And anger can be really debilitating. It can, if you internalize it, it could defeat you. But I really feel like it's important that you be able to if you can write about it, you can you can use it for something else. And that's what I try to do. But it's still hard. I mean, I'm not saying that's easy, you know. So I, I have more questions, obviously, but I also want um, you know, to give space to any of the students who want to ask. Yeah, anything. You guys don't even have to ask about Pamela novel, like if there's anything else that you just uh yeah um thank you for being here and talking to us about this um you just mentioned how like um all the anger that you were kind of like struggling with you put this all into writing so i just wanted to ask like after you wrote the book did the anger kind of dissipate like were you able to reconcile with it or did it is it still kind of there and then like do you have advice for students who are trying to like deal with that anger as well against this whole history of sure. just like horrible stuff okay no the anger is not gone like completely but it definitely helped because um i'll just tell you all like you know to i grew up in north carolina okay i grew up in the south 
Like I was the only Asian person in my school, except for my sister. Um, so yeah, like I said to someone recently, we were talking about the Atlanta murders, like this is not a surprise. Like the minute I was conscious, I was in a war zone. You know, I was called the CH word, the J word from the time I was like six, you know, five, whenever I could. So, you know, a child of a racialized child often enters that war zone from a very young age. And I think for Asian American women, especially, there's a way in which we're supposed to be, as, as we all know, very quiet, very, you know, you're not supposed to rock the boat. And that it's, and it's a, there's an erasure, there's an invisibility for Asian American women. And then if you do, and I will say of myself that I was actually really, really quiet. I never said anything in class, in college. Like I'm very, like I, I, I'm pretty direct and outspoken now, but it wasn't always the case. And I remember at some point in my twenties, late twenties, I was like thinking, you know, this really isn't working for me. Like being quiet, not saying anything is not actually very <laughs> helpful. So I had to consciously make myself speak. And I'm not saying that's the only way that people can um, have agency. Cause I know like some younger scholars now are talking about like the power of like inaction or inscrutability or quietness. But at my period, you know, when I was growing up or when I was a young person, definitely it was really important for me as an Asian American woman to speak out when I saw there was something like racially unjust or somebody was doing something racist to me. And it was actually really, really hard. Um, and then when I went to grad school, so I went to grad school at Berkeley. Um, and then I became an academic and I will say it was, it was really hard. I mean, it's really hard to be in an English department as the only person working on Asian American literature and nobody, everyone thinks you're just there to like be the student service person for the students, for Asian American students. Like they don't take what you're doing seriously. They don't consider it part of like poetry studies. You know, they just think you're there to do like social work. And I think the anger in my book came out from being a professor at Northwestern, not so much Wesleyan, I had a good experience at Wesleyan, but um, from being a, a professor at Northwestern's, in Northwestern's English department, being a professor at Williams where I was hired into American studies, which ended up being great, but the English department really did not want me to be involved with them at all because they really saw like Asian American, they didn't see Asian American literature as really legitimate. So I think that anger propelled me to write that institutional critique, especially in that first chapter, which is talking about the, the, the racism in the field. But I, one thing I did have, I remember consciously having to control the anger and to make the tone kind of neutral and dispassionate. Because of course you all know that like, if you're an a woman of color or a person of color and you're angry, people are like, oh, you're so angry or you're too emotional. You're not rational. So I was very conscious of the fact that I had to be very like disciplined about letting like these people speak for themselves. Like their, like their racism actually come out in their own words. And I had to control the tone. But even so, I would say that people told me it was too harsh at the time. A couple of people said, oh, this is kind of harsh, you know? And I was like trying to tone it down. And the irony is now like several decades later, later with the like younger, more radical scholars, they'll, be, they'll say to me, oh my gosh, you were too nice in that. <laughs> you were too nice in your chapter. Like you were too easy on like Marjorie Perlow. Like you, so I do think that I think what it did, I don't think it dissipated all my anger because I'm still dealing with lots and lots of crap all the time. I'll just say that. But what it did was that that anger got transmuted into an uh, argument about literary studies that I think has had a larger impact. I don't think it's as large of an impact as Yadi said in the intro, but I think it really was. And I think I get young people of color coming to me and saying, Thank you for staying out loud, what I always felt, but didn't really know, like I didn't have the language for it and never saw anyone. So I think that was important to let writers of color, poets of color know you're not crazy. People are gonna gaslight you and make you feel crazy. You're not crazy. This stuff is going, I mean, this is happening. And I think of course, the fact that it came out as an academic book with a press like Stanford gave it some credibility rather than if I had just written that and posted it on like Twitter or something, not that I would have done a 400 page book on Twitter, but, but you know, all the apparatus of like what is considered credible 
that had to be wrapped up in it. But, but no, I'm still angry all the time. And I have to tell myself also like the advice that I give to my student, I have to say like, okay, how can I turn this into something productive rather than getting so depressed or like getting so upset? But I have to say it's a challenge, but I think that if there's any way that it's still better to try to articulate what the issue is. So like one time I gave a talk at Penn State and I was really attacked by this white man who was really upset about the stuff I talked about race. And it was like, viol he was violently upset. Like he was screaming at me. And then he would like use all these tactics to undermine me by saying like things like, you didn't mention this scholar. Why do you, how could you talk about this and not mention this guy? So to, to undermine my scholarly credibility, he did another thing. He's like, I can't believe, because I said something about my parents being English professors. He said something like, I can't believe you're going autobiographical on us. So, so it was a very upsetting encounter where no one intervened, no one said anything. And then later after, of course I was upset and it was processed, but then later I tried to think about it. I was like, okay, what were those strategies? What were the things that he was doing? The strategies to try to undermine me? And how might I think about that and analyze that? So of course it doesn't change the emotional valence of it, but I don't want it just to be a thing where this person was able to like scream at me, get me upset. Of course I fought back. I did not let him do that. But still I wanted to like, maybe that's too analytical, but I think it's a way sometimes to process it, to be like, okay, what were those strategies that just took place? Let me think about that, right? But no, I'm always mad all the time, still. So we have time for one more question. So I can come from the class or if no one has a question. Or anybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if no one has a question, um, I would invite you to maybe talk about how you would revisit uh, the, the book now um, or the chapter now as we were talking about. Oh yeah, about right. Earlier. So I was gonna say that. I was gonna say a word because that chapter was written a while ago and what now, re I didn't reread it carefully, but looking back at um, that particular chapter on Pamela, I definitely think that because the book was written in the context of a larger project on Asian American poetry. So by necessity, I was not able to spend as much time on say the queer sexuality of the book, you know, this question of, of more on, I think, gender and sexuality. It's definitely something um, now I would think about. And that is, I think the subjunctive in relation to not only racialized, um, subjectivity, but also queered and trans subjectivity. So one thing I will say about my interaction with Pamela Liu after I'd written the chapter. So one of the things I did was because I sort of knew Pamela at the time, I gave them the chapter to read. And unfortunately, that is not a good idea when you're a critic to give the poet that you're working on because Pamela really wanted it to be like, almost like an authorized biography where like, like they at the time really wanted me to like, Right, so it was difficult. And one of the things, but one of the things that was helpful was um, Pamela brought up the fact that, well, at that time they were making this like kind of progression from first identifying as a, as a lesbian and then toward the, I think toward the end when I was writing the chapter, um, Pamela made the point of saying, I'm non-binary. I don't, I'm not either gender. I don't want it. So, so I did change that. I, I think it is in the chapter. But other things that were brought up were things like, I remember Pamela saying to me, well, these are all based on actual characters, like the CJ, all those people. And so Pamela wanted me actually to change some of my readings of it based on the actual biographical history of these people. And I was like, I can't do that. Cause like, I'm a critic and I'm reading this book, right? So that was a point of disagreement. Um, but I do think that this is where I was hoping that when I wrote the book and the chapter that other people would take it up and actually do more. Because I remember even talking to Leon Leo at one point, he's like, oh, I really, I'm so glad you took my poetry seriously, but I wondered why the metaphysical aspects of my poetry were not being dealt with. And I said, well, I would love to spend chapters on the metaphysical aspects of your poetry. But the fact is that, this, that the book was written to address the kind of aporia or the silence around race, right? And so that was the particular thing I was doing. But of course, any given poet, any given writer, there's like so many different facets of their work. And so definitely now, I think if I were to expand this or talk about, I would definitely engage more with the issue of, of gender and sexuality. And also I think probably more with colonialism 
because more and more I'm thinking that diaspora cannot be delinked from colonialism. And I think at that time, um, it wasn't the way people were talking about diaspora primarily. Um, I mean, maybe some people were. So I would probably do those two things. And, um, but you just can't do everything in a given time. It's just very difficult, you know? So that's not an excuse, but that would, that would probably be how I would revisit that chapter. Well, thank you, Dorothy. That's, I mean, uh, I actually didn't know that Pamela Lou um, was non-binary, so that actually really illuminates. I'm going to have to reread the book when I reread the book and think about that. So I was just like, they're like queer vibes here. I don't know like what they are, but they're like queer, queer vibes. They're definitely queer vibes. Why right. chose, yeah, why I chose the book. So um, thank you so much for being here with us and for speaking to all of us about your work and um, just being awesome. Uh, I think you're awesome, even though you're like saying that you're not as awesome as you are, but it's fine. <laughs> I don't have as much influence as you think, but thank you. <laughs> but thank you for inviting me and thank you to the students for, for coming and Ching in and others who've shown up. Um, but yeah, no, it's real pleasure. And, I, and anybody can feel free if they ever have questions later, if they want to email me, um, mm -hmm. you could always do that. If, that. if you suddenly think of something later and you're like, I want to ask this, feel free to, I'm, you know, you can Google me. Has my um, email. Yeah, I can forward you if you want to ask anyone. But it's questions. really great to meet you all and to see you all. And I hope you get through this like Zoom semester intact, you know. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, but thank you so much. And this is a great series that you're doing, Annie. No, oh, thanks. I'm really happy to be doing it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. So you are all this next. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And thanks, Ching thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give it away. Should I? Okay, so I just, okay.